for all the work hosting these webinars. We're really pleased to welcome you from the Cambridge Institute for Music Therapy Research at Anglia Ruskin University once again um, for what um, is going to be a really exciting packed round table chaired by Dr. Alex Street, who I'll hand over to in a minute. Um, here at SIMTA, we have um, training for music therapy and drama therapy students attached to us as well. Um, and we have around 17 PhD students as well working here and many different research projects across our main research areas that are healthy aging and dementia, music therapy and neuroscience. So recovering from stroke and we're gonna hear um, more about neuro rehabilitation and stroke as well this evening, mental health and children, young people and families. Um, and a lot more we could say, but um, I know that many of you come to all our webinars, so you hear about the work and vis from visiting people. And we're very interested to include more people um, to present in our webinars as well from all over the world, wherever you are. So make yourself known to us. Welcome. Over to you, Alex. Hi, good, e good afternoon, everyone from all over the world and lots of different places. Um, so our first presenters are um, Ellie Ruddock um, from Chiltern Music Therapy and University of Derby and, and um, Jill Goad and, um, from Buckinghamshire Healthcare Trust, uh, where Ellie has been running a, a service on the stroke ward. Um, and then I think what, as we go on, just give a quick in introduction, just because then it's fresher in people's minds. So. Um, this isn't about presenting the evidence based for music therapy. It's just about reporting what's going on in terms of implementation. There is an evidence base, arguably. That's, that's to be discussed. Um, do put your questions in the chat. Um, some of them we'll try and get to um, as things go on and others we'll come back to or address in the round table at the end. Over to you, um, Ellie and Jill. Hello, thank you very much, Alex. I'm just going to share my screen. I'm going to share my sound to make sure you can hear our clips as well. Okay. So hopefully you can all see the title slide on your screen. Um, so hello, thank you everybody. Uh, my name is Ellie and today uh, with my colleague Jill, we are going to describe how the multidisciplinary team have collaboratively developed the music therapy service at Wickham Stroke Unit. The presentation will last approximately 15 minutes. So this presentation aims to identify the benefits of neurologic music therapy, which I'm going to refer to as NMT for the patients, team and healthcare trust, focusing on how the service is enhancing standard therapies and how it might be developed further. We will be highlighting the findings of a service audit. Um, so the UK Stroke Pathway has been well developed since the introduction of the National Stroke Strategy in 2007, included in current national stroke, uh, sorry, national clinical guidelines for stroke, are recommendations that patients have access to a range of allied health professions, including physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech and language therapy, and dietetics. Music therapy is an allied health profession that has less presence within the current stroke pathway. The NMT service at Wickham Stroke Unit started as a 12 week pilot in 2015 and after a gap whilst funding was being approved, a permanent NHS funded service began in 2017. The service takes place every Thursday and comprises of a mixture of individual and group sessions, as well as a flexible slot that can be used for assessments, urgent referrals hospital wide, consultation, meetings and report writing. The music therapist works within the multidisciplinary team which consists of doctors, nurses, care support workers and therapists. Between July and November 2017, data about patient statistics, session aims and outcomes and patient feedback was collected about each NMT referral made. 
This information will be used confidentially within this presentation. And since 2017, the multidisciplinary team have been working together to embed neurologic music therapy into the existing standard therapies as seamlessly as possible. This hasn't come without teething problems and adjustments, but over time, a framework for collaborative working has been developed and practiced, and this will be explored within this presentation. So how does music therapy work on the ground? Jill is going to explain a little more about how physio and music therapy work together. So within physio and neurological music therapy, we work collaboratively to um, identify appropriate patients and find specific physical, sensory and cognitive treatments that can support a patient to achieve their goals. We found that within physio, um, MMT can be, can, can be accessed by a wide range of stroke patients with different stroke presentations. So we found from low arousal, early, very early stage post-stroke to patients progressing in gait re-education. Re re so it can be really adaptable and flexible in its approach. Um, we did find in the early days that, um, that we didn't, as physiotherapists, we didn't fully understand how NMT could be incorporated into our physio sessions. And on reflection, we probably brought the wrong types of patients along um, and maybe had the wrong treatment goals. But as the services developed, we've much better at identifying appropriate patients and our expectations are um, of what we can achieve are, are much better, uh, much more aligned. Um, so music you know, definitely adds a different dimension to physiotherapy treatments, uh, using that enriched environment where patients can utilize their personal music preferences, um, which obviously helps their adherence to therapy and motivate them in therapy sessions. Quite a lot of patients find physio treatment quite tiring and difficult and repetitive and actually that music helps that um, motivation and can help change their focus onto that rather than onto what you know, functional task they're practicing at the time. Um, so music therapy also gives us that opportunity to see how patients um, uh, respond to music and therapy in that different context and from a neuroplasticity point of view that's really important. Um, so yeah, so we've, we're very much a, a joint working um, to help patients achieve their goals. So on the left hand side of your screen, you'll see a, um, a diagram and this was the pathway into NMT that we developed back in 2017. However, there have had to be some changes, some due to the pandemic and some due to uh, limiting the negative impact on staff time. We have gradually over time removed the bespoke referral form and instead developed a booking in sheet and implemented verbal handovers instead. The last circle on the diagram shows the iPod pharmacy and I can talk about that in more detail if people would like in the Q&A section. On the right hand side of your screen you'll see a pie chart. Um, so patient statistics such as um, who, who was referred and who by were collected over a five month period by the music therapist and the multidisciplinary team. So um, we had 34 patients referred within that five month period, which was 18 weeks. Um, and of these, uh, 25 were made by occupational therapy, 11 by physio and seven by speech and language therapy as displayed here. Um, if we were to take these statistics again in 2021, I think they would look very equal um, and less of a dominance with OT. The reasons for referral were varied and there were a total of 24 reasons across the spectrum of communication, motor, cognition and psychosocial aims. So we've got all 24 reasons here. Some patients have multiple reasons for referral and in this case the reasons have been counted separately. The five most common reasons for referral were to strengthen the weaker side, increase participation in therapy, improve dynamic balance, attend to the side of neglect and improve sitting balance. We recorded outcomes during the audit and goal attainment scale outcomes were identified by the music therapist um, after each session upon consultation with the OT, speech and language therapist or physio. You can see here that our data found that patients were meeting their goals um, slightly more than expected during their joint music therapy session. 
and each patient's depression intensity scale circle score was obtained at the beginning and end of each session. And you can see here that the mean average uh, DISC score after the session was lower, which meant there was um, a lower level of depressive feelings felt. We also collected patient feedback. So um, the word cloud on the left of your screen here has sized each word according to frequency. So you can see what patients were saying after their music therapy sessions here, music being the most commonly used word, no surprise there. Um, as displayed in the bar chart at the top of your screen, patients were asked if they would like to attend further sessions. We only had one response um, of a no. So everybody else said that they would like to come again or they weren't asked. And the pie chart at the bottom of your screen, um, patients were asked how, enjoy, how enjoyable they found the session. They were given five options, awful, not very good, good, really good or brilliant. And of the patients that responded to this, the majority responded the session had been really good. And the second highest uh, response was brilliant. Therapy. NMT meets rehabilitation goals quicker than expected. And NMT reduces depression and increases emotional well-being. Furthermore, the data suggests that the NMT service is meeting the NICE clinical guideline for patient-centered care, the National Clinical Guideline for Stroke Standards uh, for Patient Mobilization, and the National Stroke Strategies 10-point plan for action as well. So we're linking in really nicely with the national standards. Okay, oh, I've lost Jill's slide. Here we are, I'm gonna hand back over to Jill. So we've definitely found having music therapy on the ward um, really energizes all of our members of the multidisciplinary team and it changes that normal routine. It's really valuable. It, you know, even all the healthcare assistants and the nursing staff are all engaged with it as well and, and, and like to hear it on the wards. Um, for it to be successful, we obviously needed to ensure that all members of the team understood what it was and how we could work together. And Ellie's done a great job in terms of um, education and training and really kind of showing what she can do and how we can work together. And that's really shown in the audit as well. As we've become much more aware of each other's roles, we're much more intuitive and can of each other and can adapt our sessions much more effectively. Um, and we've also become, as an MDT, much more confident to build on those recommendations that Ellie gives us and incorporate them into sessions throughout the working week. And I think that's obviously really important because um, having music throughout the week rather than just on, on one day, um, it was only last week when Ellie wasn't here, we actually managed to have two music groups in the garden, in our, in our, in our stroke garden, and another one-to-one -one session with an OT leading it. And I think that just really shows how, how incorporated it is and how embedded it is in our service that actually we will, will want to do that. Um, and it's, I said, it's really fun um, and that it really changes our week. Okay. Okay, and just to come on to our last slide here, I wanted to conclude what we've been talking about this evening. So um, it's beneficial to begin an NMT service with a pilot service first. The pilot service enabled other members of the multidisciplinary team to familiarize themselves with the intervention whilst engaging the lead members of the service delivery unit and gaining their approval or their buy-in, so to speak. Um, and it's useful to develop referral systems and clinical processes collaboratively with the multidisciplinary team. These systems should be reviewed and adapted regularly rather than seeking to set up something permanent and non-changing. If uh, further music therapy services are set up along the pathway of care, for example, in community rehab settings, the same systems and processes should be used to encourage a consistent pathway of music therapy throughout the trust. And where possible, the multidisciplinary team should work collaboratively to ensure that music therapy is embedded as successfully as possible into the existing therapy provision. Thorough handovers, session planning, goal setting, outcome discussion, and future planning should be discussed as a team throughout the referral process for each patient. The data collected in 2017 suggested that including NMT with the standard therapies increases patient engagement in therapy. 
it meets rehab goals quicker than expected, and it reduces depression and increases emotional well-being. It's recommended that therapists work flexibly within the multidisciplinary team and continue to adapt processes and systems where necessary. It would also be beneficial for the music therapist to have more communication with clinical psychologists um, to ensure that we're seeing patients with um, emotional aims too, because currently um, I don't work on the same day as a clinical psychologist. So I feel that's an area we need to work on. And uh, it's recommended that further provision of music therapy in the community is created with an outpatient and co uh, community referral system to ensure that music therapy is available throughout the whole stroke pathway for our NHS trust. Um, and lastly, I would recommend that we do another audit because this data is almost four years old. So, um, you know, I think it's time to start looking at where we're at now. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I'm just going to get my references here. This presentation will be available uh, to view afterwards. Um, I'm going to stop sharing now, but thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Ellie and Jill. Um, all of our presenters are duos with one neurologic music therapist and in that case, um, a physiotherapist, uh, but we've got speech therapy uh, as well um, as another physiotherapist and the, uh, the, there's one question in the Q&A please do put more in there I can see that most people that, that I can see anyway seem to be from a music therapy background which is great um, uh, and you might have questions about how data are collected um, and um, other sort of more specific questions I suppose about approaching neuro rehab settings as well if you're looking to get into that area and what the training needs are and um and that kind of thing but um helen and i will present some work now um which we did um and also the other thing about the presentations is um that they're they're all quite new in terms of implementation you know new posts um and um, Anna uh, Basoa and Chris Elmsley from Renovo Care will pre be presenting, where there have been quite a few major changes um, that have gone on in that service. Um, uh, so it'll be interesting to hear how, uh, about how things are running there as well. Um, so uh, that's the last slide. Excellent. It's good to be prepared. Um, so, Helen uh, Palmer is a speech and language therapist at Adam Brooks Hospital, Cambridge University Hospitals, um, and um, was a, a major driving force with other people as well in getting this up and running, this two year service evaluation, um, looking at feasibility and acceptability at two days a week. Um, so yes, again, just don't video your screen and, and respect the, the consent that the patients have, have given and we'll, we'll go through this. Um, if you want to know more about it, um, whether you're a music therapist or not, this is a great place to start. Again, we're not presenting all the evidence, it's just looking at, at services that are, are running and being trialled. So neurology music therapists are also all state registered. It's, um, and really it's training to translate what the other MDT members do into music-based exercises or experiences um, so that they maintain their fun functionality, you know, what's the, what's the goal of the exercise and, and increasing that repetition. And about providing, you know, very, very quickly being able to think immediately, this patient needs this equipment, needs to be here, this is the musical structure for the priming and timing of the movement, all of that kind of stuff. Pre-recorded music, well, that's another discussion, it has its place, but you'll see it it's, it's, um, doesn't come close um, for this sort of thing. So what's missing on the acute ward? What can NMT bring? If it brings benefits for patients to the whole service in terms of you know, dosage, length of stay, um, rehab outcomes, what's needed to implement it. So that's, there are also questions around that. A space like this with all this equipment, you know, I, I was, you know, in, in the speech therapy, this is one of the treatment rooms with all of this stuff, seeing individual patients, everything there from supporting 
breath intake and exhalation uh, to every movement you can imagine. Um, so we'll start just looking at a group that took place each. Um, so we, particularly within um, speech and language therapy, when we were working together with Alex, we did find that there was real potential for, for um, very complex patients to and more impaired patients um, to engage sooner in rehab. So we definitely saw positive impacts on mood, um, positive impacts on fatigue. And as, as speech therapists, we could work at a level of communicative intent. So we could address attention, listening, initiation, turn taking. And, and our patients who had a really significant aphasia or cognitive difficulties, they could participate in the activity without needing to understand verbal instructions. So it's so a huge um, bonus. And I think something really important is, is the sense of success or, or achievement that people could um, be enabled to experience. So if they were able to vocalize or verbalize or make a sound with an instrument, they were, they were helped to participate in a back and forth. Um, and I hope that that would give people a, some positive self-feedback, um, like I say, a, a sense of success. So that's, it's so motivating. So I think all of the elements that we've seen combine to increase engagement in therapies, um, increase activity levels, um, with the potential for better rehab outcomes and reduced length of stay. Um, just mentioning activity levels, actually, um, one of our OT colleagues, Maria Martin, says she's um, just recently carried out an audit on the unit, actually, last summer during um, the first wave or immediately after the first wave of COVID. Um, and that really demonstrated how, um, how, how low the activity levels were actually lower than previous found, previously found um, prior to pandemic in a different study. Um, so I really see that uh, music therapy, neurologic music therapy has a lot to add to um, increasing that activity level and increasing the drive as a multidisciplinary team together to facilitate that. Um, I can move to the next slide and just mention um, some observations about melodic intonation therapy. So just thinking from within the speech and language therapy perspective, Nina, can you go to the next slide? Please. So initially, Alex and I had um, been quite excited thinking as we were setting up the project, thinking we'd um, really be able to look into melodic intonation therapy. This is what we could get our, our teeth into. This would be really helpful. Um, but actually, we found that it just didn't seem to, to fit so easily for us. And I think that's a lot about the, the stage of the, the very acute stage that we're at. So we're a, we're a hyperacute and acute stroke unit and then post-acute inpatient rehab. Um, so, you know, these are just observations, but there were some limitations. As speech and language therapists, there were many, many competing um, priorities in terms of what we're trying to include in our therapy service for, for patients. So we're helping people to understand what's, what's happened to them, um, helping them to understand they've had a stroke, helping them to understand what aphasia is, um, having, having conversations, supporting them in conversations, um, helping them to discover um, the ways in which they can communicate now. So the, there's so many things that we're trying to, to do that um, bringing in a prescript, you know, a more prescriptive therapy approach um, just didn't seem to be um, so regularly helpful for us. But there are certainly elements that are helpful. And I suspect some of um, 
some of the, the roundtable group are going to speak about that um, a little bit more shortly. But there is um, the next clip actually shows a lady where Alex did use elements of um, pacing and, and pulsing and tapping. Um, can you play that, Nina? Um, exercise to do, and, and it's, there are endless variations, and it's completely bespoke to each patient that you can do these copying exercises where they're copying musical patterns, and you can use melody as well. Um, and they get to a certain point, so somewhere around being able to copy five a five beat rhythm that isn't just taps that have the same um, uh, pause between them, um, that they can then start on. on a version of melodic intonation therapy. But there are lots of modifications. There's modified um, melodic uh, MIT, which has been used in the acute setting, um, where they don't restrict the, the melody to two pitches, but it's actually um, much more accessible to allow patients to sing on a, a wider range of pitches, or so they found in that very small study. But yes, you, you absolutely, Helen, yeah, it's... it's, it's um, there's a whole range of cognitive training that you can use, you can implement to help um, those patients to start working towards more speech therapy targeted exercises. Uh, anyway, are we done? Did we, did you get through, did you play the other clip? And or? So I haven't talked from, from where we are. We haven't, uh, we oh, looked okay. at the, we looked at the group, um, <laughs> spoke a little bit about oh, that. Okay. Um, so yes, we haven't talked about the, the evaluation. Okay, let's just do 40 seconds or so and we'll just go have a look at that. Um, yes, yeah, so you can see how we rated it. So it's useful using these sorts of data collection tools. Um, but yes, it's finding other people to collect the data as well. Right, Helen, you know, get, getting sort of, I mean, it really depends what you're using it for the data. You know, we wanted to publish something with, with you know, to try and reduce the, the bias to a degree um, uh, so just go on to the next slide, Nina, please. Um, so at that two days per week over two years, 177 had NMT, averaging, um, averaging uh, you know, about uh, four sessions, um, but some, some had, you know, 30. <laughs> Um, and a good rating as well. So it's well within the helpful or, you know, towards the very helpful. Next slide. And getting the feedback as well, because so it really is indicative of, you know, what's, what's it doing? What do people on the stroke ward need? They need, to, they need more, <laughs> they need more rehab. Um, I don't know what it's like in the rest of the world, but certainly in the UK, we, you know, that, that there's more needed. Um, both the acute and um, subacute and community stages. But getting this sort of feedback that clearly shows that tolerance is improving adherence, it's good for mood, the cognitive side of things. And the next slide from staff as well that are recognizing, you know, engaging um, nonverbal patients where speech and language therapy involvement alone has been unsuccessful. So it's that, you know, collaborative element of, of, of you know, bringing in other routes into um, vocalising and um, verbal output, cognitive recovery. And next slide. Uh, and more from the relatives, you know, they come in every day, they sit with the, their relatives, you know, they do what they can. And it's great to work with them and get some feedback. Um, obviously, I spoke to many more relatives than this and set up exercises for them to do as well independently with their spouse or relative. And the last, I think, and did you, you went through this, Helen, right? No, we ha I haven't um, oh, covered just, this. Just, so. just just give us, just take us through the last two slides and then. Yeah, um, yeah. So, please. So just the fact that we, um, prior to the neurologic music therapy service, we ran a, um, a pilot with music therapy. Um, and then it was having done that and demonstrated value and engagement on the ward that we were then able to, um, together as a joint venture, apply for um, uh, funding 
from the Adam Brooks Charitable Trust um, for, for one year and then it was extended to two and um, it was well received and we were, um, it was put into the business plan, but unfortunately it was then cut from the business plan um, unbeknown to us until rather late in the day. So um, we've learned a few lessons there in terms of um, continuing the conversation and um, really being involved, um, I think especially in a very large organization. So I think the key to the su success of, of bringing neurologic music therapy back will be um, thinking about how can we embed it as a core therapy? Um, how can we demonstrate the contribution to um, discharge planning, the contribution to roles such as key worker roles, um, keep building the evidence base um, and, and demonstrate an impact on, on flow and, and patient outcomes. Um, Obviously, we've been hearing some very interesting points from, from Ellie and Jill at um, Bucks as well regarding um, how, how the service is meeting stroke guidelines. So that was, that was really good to hear. Um, some of the key learnings are the next slide. Um, yeah, just in setting up, in, in introducing um, a clinician into an acute NHS setting that, that was new to the clinician. Um, Alex, perhaps you ought to say something about how, how you found it, but um, there were things that um, we were aware that we needed to, to run through. So um, we were very fortunate to be able to, to provide a space within speech and language therapy. We're very fortunate, but there is huge competition for space in, in an acute hospital. Um, and then there's a lot around daily life on the wards. So um, uh, yeah, your patients don't come for appointments. Um, it's, it's an ever flexible setting. So there are lots and lots of demands on, on folks time. So um, your patient might be otherwise occupied. There might be a medic about to see them. They might be in physio, they might be in occupational therapy, they might be with the psychologist. So they may just need to rest, they may not be feeling up to participating. So there's there's a lot of flexible working in, in the acute setting. And then there were things, things that um, hopefully we'll get the service back and, um, you know, just at that point think, okay, with the hospital documentation systems, the EPIC is the um, uh, computerized note system. Um, and there are things that you can have built in to EPIC to collect data. And that's something we'd want to do um, if we were um, reintroducing the service. And um, Alex, you contacted the, the SNAP Stroke Sentinel National Audit Programme. You contacted them. Um, yep. We talked about how we could be um, including the time spent with your service within the unit's uh, SNAP data, which would be a bonus as well, so, yeah. Um, if anyone wants to read the, the data, it's published in um, uh, uh, Topics in Stroke Rehabilitation, you'll find it there. Um, so we won't go too much into that. Thanks, that's great, thank you, Helen. Um, we'll move on to Anna Money, who's a speech and language therapist um, with Norfolk Community Health and Care Trust at the Coleman Hospital and Kate Curtis, um, uh, who is the neurologic music therapist there, and that's another new post. Take it away. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, so, yeah, so I'm Anna, and Kate is about to. Um, so um, just getting everything up. So Kate is the neurologic music therapist here. And as Alex said, I'm the speech therapist. And we work in um, Norwich in a level one inpatient rehab unit, um, which means we work with highly complex patients with um, highly complex rehab needs. Um, so for example, we work with patients with tracheostomies and those that are in a prolonged disorders of consciousness. 
So Kate is with us on site two days a week. Um, and this is a one year pilot project. So that's one of the newer ones um, that we'll be talking about. Uh, Kate was here in 2017 for a year as student placement. Um, and then um, we've received funds for her to be here for this pilot year. Anything to add to that, Kate? Uh, no, that was great. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> okay, so... I'll be um, quick. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to just really quickly talk about um, the group that we've been running. So when I was um, a student on the ward, I was running a group in person for about up to eight patients. And I wrote my whole master, uh, my major project on it. Um, it was a really important intervention on the ward. Um, and I basically decided this needed to go ahead even through the pandemic. So we set it up on Zoom. So I sit in an office and um, sing into my laptop and patients join from their rooms on iPads. Um, it's an absolute nightmare every week tech wise, but we endure it and we do it and the patients love it. Um, so we tend to use singing songs, music listening, um, and then we add in some sort of NNT functional stuff. So attention training and um, Tim, so I kind of get uh, somebody to take tambourines and drums and things into all, all the patients' rooms and they're all sort of joining in using their sort of limbs as well. So um, the main focus is on the social aspect um, because they are all isolated in their rooms at the moment, um, but um, there is an element of functional rehab as well. Um, Anna, did you want to talk about the social light? You're on mute, lovely. Sorry, um, just feeding back really the, the response that you got from patients. Um, so two here, it's, I enjoy it very much. It's great because it brings everyone together and makes my rehab more interesting. It's helping me to move my right arm more easily when using instruments and listening to music. Also helping with my low mood and anxiety. Um, and I think it just sort of pulls together everything that you've heard from um, all of these presentations really, but just how um, music therapy alongside an other interventions can have such a positive impact in, in, very, very, um, in a lot of different areas. Great. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to kind of talk about how um, music therapy works within the MDT. Um, so referrals are made to me by um, other therapists on the team. Um, we routinely do joint sessions. Quite often before I see the patient, I might actually just observe another session, a physio session or something. Um, I am included in kind of all the important things that happen. So case conferences, we talk about each patient once a fortnight for half an hour. The whole team that works with that patient gets together. Uh, we review their goals, we look at their progress, and we work together to kind of move that patient on. Um, and I'm sort of part of all the sort of handovers, meetings, discharge notes and things where I need to be. Um, and I think some music therapy services work where the music therapist goes in and kind of just does appointment after appointment after appointment and maybe doesn't have that involvement in the team. Um, I feel like within this setting, it's just so important. Um, and I feel like we're making more impact, seeing fewer patients, but doing it properly. And I really like that I'm being treated like just any other member of the team. Um, so not just kind of an added bolt on of something additional, um, but I am actually a valued member of the team. Um, if I'm conscious. I've got, we've obviously yeah. got this, but I've, I, think, I think it's just got... really so we've got a few slides that just feedback from staff to see to comment on how um, beneficial they've found it. Um, but as you said, I think we can leave it at that. Yeah. Um, cool. But thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, thanks. For and any questions, please, um, we will respond. Yes. Um, we, yes. Time has gone. Thank you very much for doing that presentation. Um, time has gone a bit awry. Um, so the round table bit may be no table at all of any shape. Um, so we'll move swiftly on, but put your questions in the chat and we can always email you um, responses or continue answering afterwards. Anna Pessoa, um, neurology music therapist at Renova Care, which was formerly known as the Raphael Medical Centre, now under new ownership, lots of changes going on there. And Chris Elmsley, the speech and language therapist there. Give us your slides. Oh gosh, bear with me, here we go. Hi, um, I'm Anna, this is Chris. Uh, we work at Holland and Park Hospital, uh, which is part of the Renovo Care uh, group. 
um, along with uh, three other sites, uh, Victoria House, Wanborough House and South Newton. Uh, we are the only one that um, has neurologic music therapy. This has been an ongoing service. Uh, it, it, exists, it has existed for many years. And in the past year, there has been a profound change, uh, organizational change. Um, and it was decided that NMT would stay as part of the rehab um, pathway because it is um, evidence-based. Um, I see. I only see patients that are on the acute neuro rehab pathway. Um, the patients come to us, so we are a level to be um, facility. Uh, they come to us, um, and I do an, an initial assessment. Then we all attend a goal setting meeting, which is attended by nurse, doctor, by the whole MDT and the therapy team. Uh, we then have a review meeting or two, depending on, on the length of stay, and we then um, are part of the discharge planning as well. Um, I typically see patients, I see patients two to three times a week, typically for 12 weeks, which is um, the usual uh, funding that the patients have. Uh, most of our patients, the vast majority of the patients is funded by the NHS. So, um, as, as stimulus specialists, we use music um, processing to engage and retrain the non-musical brain, and that's where we're different. Uh, some patients, from my experience, uh, won't initially engage in other therapists, but they will in music therapy or, or NMT. Uh, the goals are uh, achieved quicker. I agree with uh, everyone uh, that has mentioned that. Um, and that's kind of the perception of the whole um, MDT. Um, fun, I think, definitely brings a new dimension to the therapeutic process and it facilitates uh, performance of functional tasks. Um, the MDT sometimes seek music therapy as a last resource, and maybe I, I personally need to, to do more work in this area, so, so this doesn't happen so much. So the page, from, from a patient's perspective, I, I receive sometimes uh, spontaneous um, feedback. This, all this feedback you can see is from last month. From, from March, the first and the third uh, statements uh, were spontaneous, happened in sessions, and they were kind of haha moments, I think, for patients. Um, the first one refers, it was a patient with, with uh, severe neglect and, and other complications. Um, and we did, I did musical neglect training with him, and, and suddenly he could he could see better. Uh, so this, this happened in session. Uh, the third one was in a, in a gate training session. Um, the fact that the metronome and the, and the rhythmic uh, stimulus was there made him feel that he could walk better in, in, symmetrically. Um, and again, that was really important to, to him. Um, from... The MDT. So I, I asked the MDT what 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 do they think about um, NMT? And so one of the occupational therapists said uh, NMT is a creative and fun extension of my therapy. Uh, one of the physiotherapists uh, fed back that uh, NMT helps patients' movements and enhances engagement. Uh, the joint work um, with NMT. Um, is valuable so music input facilitates um, the inhibition of compensatory movements and promotes active movements. Um, the neuropsychologist feels that um, joint working is successful with patients uh, who struggle with memory in particular uh, and also those who lack motivation suddenly um, become alive in sessions. And yeah. over to Chris. Uh, yeah, so what is it like working with Anna? It's lovely. Um, so yeah, we do a lot of two-to-one therapy sessions. Typically, if Anna's seeing patients two to three times a week, we might double up for either one or two of those sessions, basically depending on the patient's need. And if they aren't 
um, engaging a lot more in NMT, then we might choose to, to have all of our sessions together. It really does depend. Um, again, sharing of strategies and resources. A lot of the neurologic music therapists, as well as the MDT that have spoken so far, have talked about a lot of the techniques they use. And we find just sharing of information across all of the therapists so we can use that within our sessions as well. Um, we may be certain experts in some manners, but they are definitely experts in their own. Um, and as well, because typically sometimes we might have a cohort that's quite big and we uh, might work with two or three patients together at one time. Um, so just having a debrief weekly just to see where we're at within our therapies and what's generalizing um, to both individual sessions and, and what the MDT has observed. So as well as having those MDT meetings, just having those um, conversations between uh, the both of us is, is really important. Um, yeah, so I think the, the really key parts, um, I won't talk too much about the, the therapy perspectives that um, a lot of the SLPs have talked about, um, but I will probably mention MIT because I think we're further along the pathway, so melodic intonation therapy. And, and I definitely would agree for some patients I've found that it isn't appropriate because you need a lot of that attention and that one-to-one -one engagement. Um, but I think patients who are able to really see the progress that they're making and maybe have slightly better attention Anna have found that maybe um, portioning tasks so Anna providing more of that uh, rhythm and melody prompting whereas I'm maybe giving a lot of uh, written and spoken support so it's almost um, disseminating where our strengths are and then separating the tasks between us which has been quite helpful um, so yeah, uh, as we say, uh, music therapists have an expertise and deep understanding of m melody and rhythm that actually it's something which during our um, training as speech therapists, we, we don't have much, um, much training on in particular. So actually going for the experts is probably a lot better than us, you know, trying to sing that pitch that we can't quite get to. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and like we say, you know, being able to provide them as accurate model as possible um, is only going to support support for the uh, patient's learning. Um, so yeah, thinking about a more errorless approach. So uh, especially I found patients with poor expressive ability. So we're talking about an expressive aphasia. Um, they often have that unimpaired prosody, um, whereas the language content is really, uh, really difficult. So if they're able to actually be able to produce it in song, it provides them that sort of inspiration of I have achieved something. I've achieved something quite grand. And that's really, I think, quite key when uh, someone might be quite emotionally labor and really struggling to, to get that initial therapy engagement to then take that into the, into the other therapies. Um, so I've put here about the holistic approach. Um, we know that a lot of patients who've gone through a traumatic experience, like having a stroke, it really impacts their identity. And that sort of mismatch between what is my identity after a stroke and before. And I find music is actually so core cool. You know, we all have favorite bands and favorite experiences and uh, being able to have a link between your previous identity to, to who you are now. Um, I find that actually uh, music therapy is something which can be can be really helpful there. Um, so, yeah, just to, to sort of promote self-acceptance between uh, between the, what their identity is. And I've also talked about overcoming barriers. I think the biggest barrier that we experience is that frustration, especially when someone's got a really expressive uh, expressive and receptive gap so uh, being able to provide a sort of more positive and accepting environment not that we all don't try and provide that but I think because neurologic music therapy is almost as a core quite a holistic profession um, it's very um, it provides that environment for the patients yeah okay I'll show you um, two vignettes. I'll try to be brief. So the first one, um, a female patient, uh, 57 years old, she sustained the right MCA, uh, middle cerebral artery stroke. Uh, she was admitted to us three months post-injury. She was uh, very nervous and, and anxious um, when she was admitted and she was emotionally labile. She also had and resolved issues from the past, which uh, emerged in sessions quite quickly and made therapy in general, the rehab process uh, really, really difficult for her. Um, she wasn't gaining much from the sessions because, because she had severe crying episodes. Uh, I came in in the, in the first week 
Um, and in the very first session, we did um, to acknowledge her left side neglect. We did musical neglect training. I'll, I'll show you what. She, so I used the Albert's Crossing test um, to, 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 to assess, to, to do a first assessment. And here you can see before my intervention. Uh, so the patient needs to, for those who don't know, patients need to cross the lines. Uh, they see, and this patient crossed these lines. And after a 10 minute intervention where I laid um, uh, chime bars across her table uh, and we played together for, for 10 minutes, she did this. Um, and, um, and it's, quite, it's quite evident that the immediate change there. Um, she also, because she was so emotionally labelled, she also um, agreed to write songs. It was really difficult for her to speak about her feelings and emotions. So she was a, a, a Elvis fan, a devoted Elvis fan. So she she wrote two or three um, songs. I mean, she she wrote the words to the melodies, to the existing melodies. And here's uh, one verse that she wrote, uh, she was referring to her partner. Um, this lady was, um, was discharged four months after uh, we, we, we received her um, and, and she, was, she was able to self-regulate, which was the, the, one of the biggest achievements for her. Second vignette. Um, this is a patient uh, I'm currently working with. We are working with actually. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so she's 58 years old. She had a left MCA. Uh, she was admitted to us three months uh, and a half post injury. And um, oh boy, she loves music and, and she knows so many songs. She really gives me around for my money um and uh, so so i'm using that to my advantage um and 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 i use it to to do singing to do uh mustin uh, so uh, fr phrase completion and also rhythmic speech cueing um although she she doesn't have i know this is uh, more appropriate for these arthritic patients i feel it it really helped helps her and Chris has noticed as well after the sessions she can really slow down and sometimes find the words when normally she she wouldn't be able to uh, that was my last slide so I'll just say because I'm mindful of time um yeah that working in an within an MDT it's really valuable and if we work together, I think that's the main message from yeah. us anyway. Uh, if we work together, we, we can achieve the goals and, and, and anything the patient wants quite quicker and in a more efficient way. Um, yeah. Yeah, and if we're to provide real patient-centered care, then actually it's what works for the patient. Yeah. And if NMT is what works for the patient, then, then I think that's what we need to provide. Brilliant, thank you, Anna and Chris from, from no Renovo Care down in Kent. Um, oh, so we've got uh, eight minutes left for questions, but you know, I've responded to a couple of people, um, some questions about how do you introduce um, neurologic music therapy to a patient, um, which, you know, it depends where it is for a start, but if we, and, and again, Anna and Chris, you're, you, as you acknowledge, you're sort of further down the, the line a bit um, in some cases, I mean, there's still huge need for the patients, very complex patients as well. And that's a really sort of hot issue as well is patient complexity and how that can be assessed very quickly and, and, and that they're given the best possible rehab um, and goal setting. Um, so uh, also acknowledging that the, the transformed identity, I mean, that interesting has, hasn't come up from anybody else and coming to terms with what's changed. And of course, it's because it's further down the, the neuro rehab pathway, but, it, but it's still visible in the, in the acute setting, I would say. Uh, I think um, Helen and others would agree as well. You can see patients who are gonna 
it's going there's going to be that that ahead you know and you worry about them you think well when what's going to happen in community stroke you know or neuro rehab you know where are the neuropsychologists uh, and and other people who can help them on that journey to things like you alluded to cool, you directly spoke about Chris which is you know what are the preserved aspects of that person's personality what are the preserved skills that we can then go let's do this because then we then there's a road into doing this which isn't so easy and all those kinds of things so it's and that kind of the, the whole holistic um, view of the patient that all of the perspectives 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 that was the computer glitching <laughs> Um, from occupational therapy, physio, speech therapy, neuropsychology, neurosic music therapist. So, um, introducing, I mean, I found on the ward, um, Helen, uh, you do, I'd just go and see a patient and I would just start. I wouldn't introduce it. Or I'd say, okay, we're going to go and do some exercises, help get your, um, uh, get some words coming, get your arm moving. Um, come on and just go. You know that, and just do it. You know, the sooner you, the quicker you get to it, um, the better. You even going to someone at their bedside, taking if you if you can take the bare essentials, it, it might just be your voice that you need, and you just go there and you start singing. You know, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Alex. You know, and that's it. Anyone have anything else to add in terms of, of that side of things? I think it's a definitely a way into a patient and it's definitely a way to, to find out about them as a person quicker. Um, and I think having that conversation, having that just mutual talk about music and about things that happen into our life, just it breaks down the barriers quicker. Mm. Yeah. And, and it's all done very sensitively. Every, I can see Helen's got a hand up. Everybody's, you know, we're, neuro, we're music therapists. We're trained in those sort of psychological models and everything. And we're aware that sometimes it might upset people if we mention music. Helen, what did you? Well, I just think it's a fantastic example of multidisciplinary working, which to me is where music therapy should be. And it's really interesting hearing everybody else speaking about it from your perspective who isn't a music therapist. And I suppose what it's making me think about is training. Um, and I know that you'll probably all have things to say about that, but um, I suppose from the perspective of how music therapy can influence physio and speech and language and um, uh, occupational therapy and other training and then vice versa, you know, what, what current music therapy training should be doing to incorporate and make sure that the, these approaches are embedded. But that, I don't need to take up the time. I can, I can write to you all if there are audience questions, but I sort of wanted to get it, raise it it's very inspiring um, listening to all the different presentations. Thank you. Um, there's a question if someone wants to take this, we've got four minutes. Instruments for um, neglect uh, training. Go for it, Annie, you're nodding. I can't see anyone else. I don't know what I've done, hey, bear with me. Oh gosh, here I am. Okay, uh, musical neglect training. I, it depends on the patient. It depends on the patient is. If if the patient is in the room, I tend to, to bring the, the, the bar chimes with me. Um, this one's here, <laughs> right here, hang on. <laughs> so I'm still at work, so I can show you. The, these ones. Uh, and I just spread them apart. They are very easy to just spread apart. If they, I see them here in the music therapy room, I might, um, I, I let them choose um, which instruments appeal to them more and I, and I place them around the, the patient and I ask them to, to play, I might ask them to play a sequence um, that will direct their attention to the left side. And um, so, so I would say any instrument really goes as long as, as it's around the patient and around their visual uh, field. Um, and, and also when I would say when, when doing this technique, sometimes patients need the, ver the verbal prompting and say, oh, or, or the hand uh, on hand uh, uh, assistance to get to the left side, to the neglected side. Can I add something? Um, so 
I've used some similar thing on it. I've used the same chime bars, um, and you know, you start with them maybe midline, and then start to sort of spread them around to the left side. Um, and then when a patient got really good at that, um, I then and then jumbled them up, and so I was like shouting out like one, two, five, like if they had to kind of like play the right ones. Um, so I kind of have the patient looking around a lot more, and just kind of rather than going just from right to left, they were moving backwards and forwards and having to look. Um, and that was quite effective as well. Okay, uh, can you hear me? La last point here, I like this question. I really like this question from Michael Nadelski. How specific is, uh, is the influence from music in comparison to just increasing social interaction? For example, if you just play some board games, spending time with the patients um, will lead to similar results, question mark. Well, of course, the go on uh, I'll, I'll just say one thing um before ellie i can say i think i'm going to pick you to go for this one um that um it's important to, sit, to find what motivates patients some some people had hobbies where they were knitting or gardening or whatever it is if you can incorporate that it's great but it's how it affects the brain how it stimulates the brain so ellie what, what do you have to say about that yeah, well, just to add on to that, I know we're really short on time, but, you know, the presence of music stimulates both hemispheres of the brain and gives us access to all of the remaining healthy plasticity in the brain. So in terms of um, the presence of music versus the no music, you are already going to access much more of the brain and that healthy brain tissue that's still left um, after the brain injury has occurred. So, I mean, I think I personally and professionally have um, have seen, yes, the presence of music has such a strong impact at engaging patients, giving us access to all of that healthy plasticity and giving us the best shot at rehab, I think, as well. Absolutely. Anyone else? Any uh, Anna or um, uh, Jill or any of the other, um, you know, physios, anything to add to that? Well, bang on seven o'clock. No, I think it's it's just tapping into everything, isn't it? I think Ellie said, you know, it's what I'd say say back to you, Michael, is is what about doing both of those things? Um, you know, what about engaging them in those activities and doing music? Because I think that's the thing, isn't it? It's never just one thing. And we always talk about this like toolboxes, don't we? So, you know, you're not going to eat dinner without your knife, fork and spoon. And I think rehab isn't about speech therapy. It's not about OT. It's not about music therapy. It's about everything and actually doing all the different things that where you're going to get the best outcomes possible. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yes. And of course, OTs bring all sorts of things in that respect. And what well, we all do. I mean, physios get sports gear out, speech therapists get all sorts of other sort of stimulation in that kind of area. It could be a game. It could be I went to the shops and I bought and then the other person and all of that and supported, you know, conversation and everything. Um, great. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And thank you. Um, all the clinicians after a hard day seeing patients uh, coming and presenting and I think we should do this again and we'll maybe we'll we'll keep talking about this sort of implementation what how we can build on what patients need and what services need from this multidisciplinary perspective great have a great evening okay <laughs> bye. bye thank you bye, bye. bye.